the brief neuro exam is there to use when patients present with neurological symptoms but focused history taking fails to highlight red flags for serious neuropathology. The examination is therefore required to ensure that there's no occult pathology that wasn't picked up on history taking, which of course can and does happen. The evidence base for an essential neuro exam has been established by Moore et al and has identified key elements required to perform a clinically useful examination. The limits of this tool include when the examination needs to be tailored to a specific disease, such as peripheral neuropathy or Parkinson's, for example, where features such as bradykinesia and postural instability need to be elicited to support the history. So in summary, history is key, but the accompanying neuro exam doesn't need to be overly long and complex to be helpful. The brief neuro exam can be used when you've safely excluded pathology and require rapid but comprehensive neuro assessment. Can you just walk one foot in front of the other as if you're walking on a tightrope? Testing gait is critically important to neurologists as it draws together lots of examination findings. And ultimately, if a patient is walking normally, it suggests their motor function is probably fine. However, there are some specific gait pattern abnormalities that you must know about. For example, a spastic gait pattern or a cerebellar ataxic gait pattern. Or else, if we'd found extra pyramidal signs examining the patient, we would be actively looking for Parkinsonism, for example. The other abnormality that you might see is of somebody with a peripheral neuropathy and foot drop, as shown here. I'm going to start with visual fields. Okay. Just look straight at me and point to the hand that moves. When examining the visual fields, the key point is to keep yourself at arm's length and place your finger midway between yourself and the patient in space. You can see we tested for visual neglect first and then went on to check each quadrant individually for a visual field defect, such as hemianopia, secondary to stroke, for example. It's important to have knowledge of the visual field pathway anatomy, as you can see in this diagram here. That's great. And let's look at your pupils. So just look straight ahead for me. When assessing pupils, the key point is to assess for symmetry and looking at both the direct and indirect or consensual response to light, as illustrated in the reflex anatomy pew pathway here. With fundoscopy, you need to give a clear spot for the patient to focus on and encourage them to keep their eye on that spot. Right, optic disc is fine with venous pulsation. Just look straight ahead for me. The key point is to visualise the disc, and there are some examples here of normal and abnormal discs. We can comment on whether the disc margins are crisp, for example, or whether you can see venous pulsation. This is a helpful sign in ensuring pressures behind the eye are normal. You may not see it, but if you do, it is useful. And then just follow my finger with your eyes and tell me if you see double. For extraocular movements, the key point is to keep the patient's head still, and you can even place your finger gently on the forehead if necessary to ensure this. Then allow for a smooth movement to assess the function of specific intraocular muscles, as illustrated in this anatomy diagram here. The kind of abnormalities that you might see can include a third nerve palsy, for example, or a sixth nerve. Or the kind of eye movement abnormalities you may get in myasthenia gravis, for example, where you can get a complex ophthalmoplegia, as illustrated here. Now just close your eyes tight, real tight. When assessing the facial musculature, the key point is simply to assess for asymmetry first. True facial nerve weakness is usually pretty clear, but sometimes it can be more subtle, generally in upper motor neuron lesions, and the various movements that we test are designed to elicit these, as illustrated in these images here. And then just open your mouth for me. Just look at your tongue. So when testing tongue movements, it's important to look for smooth, controlled movements. So this is testing not just cranial nerve 12, but just to give an idea of bulbar function in general. So following with a cough. Give me a big cough. <coughs> or looking, as we've shown here, for tone when pressing the inside of the mouth gives us more information regarding latter function. Cranial drift is a useful sign as it helps to point to the side of the lesion contralateral to the drift, for example, in a stroke. And just close your eyes. OK. Rapid alternating movements in dystiodocokinesis 
are both used to test cerebellar function. The rapid alternating movements are used more commonly in North America, for example. Finger nose ataxia, essentially we're trying to assess cerebellar function. And the key point here when testing this specific point is to clarify your terms. For example, touch your nose and then my finger here. Ataxic conditions can be picked up using this, and you may find dysmetria, for example, when there's overshooting the mark. When testing tone in the upper limbs, we're looking first at the elbow here, and then we're looking at the wrist. When assessing power especially, instructions are critically important. So the best tip is to act out the movement, for example, put your arms up like this. Just push me away. And keep your instructions crystal clear. Then test power on each side in sequence. Make sure you leave a big enough angle at the elbow to ensure you get a true reflection of power, with elbow extension in particular, for example. When assessing the reflexes, the key point is to position the patient for each reflex and palpate the tendon if possible, and give yourself enough room to get a decent swing length. As always, test each side in sequence. And it's just going to have a look at your legs as well. When assessing tone, it's important to position the patient so they can relax, which usually means lying supine. But essentially, when you're looking at lower limb tone in the legs, if you flex the leg at the hip and the ankle flies off the couch, it suggests it's more likely to be a pyramidal tract or upper motor neurone problem, as you can see in this video here. Just lift your leg up for me. Right up. Push up hard. Okay. When assessing power in the low limbs, again, it's important to be explicit in your instructions. Bring your heel to your bottom and kick me away. That's fine. Just bend your leg, go that way. Kick me away. That's fine. Just bend your leg out, so that's for cloners. On the other side. That's fine. Just push up your toes, push down, push up your toes, push down. Just let your legs go all floppy. When assessing reflexes, put your hand under the knee to take the weight and ensure the patient is as relaxed as possible. Just flop your legs out. It's like a rectangle, that's the bottom of the rectangle, that's the top of the rectangle. That's the top of the rectangle, that's the bottom of the rectangle. That's fine. Just going to scratch your foot. It's a little bit uncomfortable, it's not painful. That's fine. When testing sensation especially, history is really the most important factor here. You should always test from where the patient complains yes. of a problem, from an area of abnormality yes. to normality. However, if you're looking for a peripheral neuropathy, of which diabetes is probably one of the most common causes, testing for vibration sense using a 128 hertz tuning fork is probably the most sensitive test of early peripheral nerve dysfunction. However, if the history, for example, is more suggestive of an upper motor neurone or spinal cord problem, you really want to be mapping out a sensory level. Thank you. All done. So that took about three or four minutes at a fairly relaxed pace, and yet covered all the essential elements required to ensure that there's no occult pathology, following the most important aspect of neurological assessment, as we've said, the neurological history. Neurologists do this examination day in and day out, quickly, safely and efficiently. So do consider incorporating this routine into your own practice. And you can visit the following links to some useful resources.